While I was in France, I met up with Chris Busby, and we started the interview uh, by talking about Libby Halevi and nuclear hot seat. And of course, it's uh, she just got through her sixth year of uh, interviews and news reports about nuclear issues. So we, I start off the interview uh, by asking him, um, uh, you know, would he like to wish uh, Libby Halevi uh, a sort of uh, congratulations on all her hard work. We also discussed a number of issues, including the British nuclear test veterans case, uh, the Euratom uh, sort of appeal, and also uh, Joe Mangano's and Chris Busby's uh, new paper on uh, uh, child mortality caused by fracking, and uh, more specifically, uh, possibly down to radiation from radium. So uh, anyway, forthwith, here it is. I it for so long because I, I know how difficult it is to do these things and to have been there for five years, is it? No, six now. Six years, um, you know, continually interviewing people and, and ensuring that, that all the connections are correct and, and that the internet site works and, and all of these things is a lot of hard work. Um, and to have stuck it for so long is, is absolutely admirable. And, uh, to, and people like Libby... Um, are absolutely necessary to our to, to our our scheme, and our scheme is to advise the public of the health effects of exposure to ionising radiation. Something which is almost entirely blanked in the in the in the in the in the, in the main media um, through through producing sci well in my case producing scientific studies and reports. Uh, which normally would only go to journals and nobody would read them. So, so they have to get to they have to get to the public through through routes like Libby's and and through the internet. Essentially, the internet has opened up this whole area. It's it's it's, it's been a massive development as far as as far as we're concerned, and it must be an, a complete nightmare to those uh, in power who are trying to sustain the control of the public and the exclusion. Uh, from the public of, of this kind of information. So yes, jolly good. Hooray for, for Libby. And of course we, we were discussing earlier about the journalists and their pressures they have with these slap suits the, these, the, to basically stop them saying certain things about corporations and all medicines and all whatever. Um, and we also know that uh, Theresa May nearly lost the election completely uh, because of social media, even though the media was totally against Corbyn, uh, social media was able to step in and offer truths and uh, common sense uh, issues, uh, and real issues as well, as opposed to the ad hominem attacks that the mainstream media were doing. Now, I'd like to sort of move on to the updates uh, to do with the ECJ uh, uh, Uratom uh, sort of uh, area that you're working on at the moment um, and could you give us uh, yeah, an update on the paper that you're involved with at the moment which is uh, to do with this and uh, a, a general update on the actual uh, sort of specifics of, of uh, who came back you know who's come back to you and how that's all working. Well we, st we have to start in case people don't know with, with, with the background which is that there is a law in Europe that, that, that emerged in 1996 uh, through the Euratom community, uh, and the law is about uh, is called the Basic Safety Standards Direct Directive, uh, and it it controls the amount of radioactivity that people can be exposed to essentially, and it, one of the clauses because because of course you never know whether your science is correct or at least. Um, at the time, the Greens in the European Parliament suggested this, that there was a clause included which said that if new and important evidence emerges about the health effects, then the whole thing has to be redone. Uh, and it's redone through what's called re-justification. Now, justification, which is defined in this law, is you, is you say, well, we know that radiation causes a certain number of cancers, a certain number of deaths, we know that, but we're going to justify the use of radioactivity uh, in nuclear power stations and you know various other schemes, uh, on the basis that we're going to allow a certain number of people to get cancer, uh, and on the other side, side we balance that against the advantages to society. So that's what the law is. Okay, but the point about this law is that it has this clause, that, which I call a suicide clause, 
which says that you can um, you can change the, the the scientific basis for the amount of radioactivity that you can be exposed to if new and important evidence emerges. Well, new and important evidence has emerged after Chernobyl. En enough studies have been done after Chernobyl now to know at minimum uh, that there have been an, a, a, a sig significant increase in child in in, in um, congenital malformations and heritable diseases after in all of the countries that have been studied and this is a lot of different countries and a lot of different groups have, stu have studied it and a lot of different papers have been written but of course none of this has been emerged in the media so about a year ago uh, English Mitz, Professor English Mitz Feierhaker got in touch with me and said we should write a paper about this so, um, so she sent me a lot of information and I, I sort of and then she wrote a paper and then I changed it and it went around the place and eventually I managed to get it published in quite a prestigious journal so this would represent new and important evidence now on the basis of that uh, by, the, by, by December of, of last year we decided to uh, ask people in the member state countries, individuals in the member state countries, to write to their uh, Euratom contact. There's a, the Euratom law designates a contact in each of the countries. If a particular person, he's on a website, he's got an email, you can write to him. Okay? And we ask people in the member state countries to write to their contact person and to say, you know, excuse me, but there's this new and important evidence and it, it, it's certainly important enough to trigger this clause 6.1 and we want you to do something. So starting in December, and starting with you, in fact, writing to the Irish Radiological Protection Institute, the RPII, Radiological Protection Institute of Ireland, um, and I, dra I drafted the, uh, the, the basic idea, the, the, the basic challenge, uh, uh, which, was, which was predicated on this paper about the congenital malformations and said, look, you know, you've got to now discuss this and decide whether you're going to alter your dose, dose limits. And the important thing about this is that these dose limits that, that, that derive from exposures to Chernobyl radiation, they were very low doses. They were, uh, you know, as conventionally, as conventionally calculated, they were doses around the 1 millisievert, 10 millisievert level, or even less. But nevertheless, because it was internal radiation, it, it can't be it can't be analysed in terms of the the millisievert idea, you know, as if it were external radiation. Because these isotopes, these substances, a lot of them bind to DNA, of course, you know, they, so they accurately target the mechanism for genetic damage. So, <coughs> uh, what happened was that was that you wrote to the RPII, I wrote to the English. Um, radiological justification people. They actually have a justification authority in England and asked them and, and said you, you have to do this because here's the evidence. And also I wrote to the Committee on Medical Aspects in Radiation in the Environment, or my colleague Bramhall did. And we even wrote to the ICRP as, as well, you know, who are the, the International Commission on Radiological Protection, has been the sort of gold standard for radiation protection uh, since 1952. And we wrote, uh, we, somebody, in, we, and I, 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 I wrote to the Swedish authorities and, and my colleague Ditter Rietemar wrote to the Swedish authorities, so we did Sweden. We did France, Hervé Courtois did France. And, Colin, uh, yes. uh, and, and we had somebody in Denmark uh, who wrote, wrote to the Danish authorities. And we asked various other people to, to, to write, but essentially, and I was quite astonished by this, uh, Hardly anybody was was prepared. Very, very few people were prepared to send this letter. And of course, there was nothing to it. All you have to do is sign the blooming letter, you know, say and say, "I'm a citizen of the country. Do something." See, uh, there was somebody in Germany who said he'd done it, but I haven't heard back from him. But I have heard back from the. And then somebody in Italy, I sent Austria, I sent. I haven't heard back from any of those people. And these are all big deal anti-nuclear activists, you know. I mean, we're not talking about just some guy, Mrs. Smith at the corner shop. We're talking about some, you know, people who would consider themselves to be the head of anti-nuclear yeah. activity in the particular country, you know. Global 2000. Guy was the head of Global 2000 in Austria. And Austria is like a big anti-nuclear nation. Nothing, okay. I even met the guy. In, in, I went to North Wales to a conference there. I asked a lot of those North Wales people who were all like, you know, uh, opposed to this nuclear power station, opposed to that nuclear power, nobody did anything. Nobody. Well, I, but noticed, never... I noticed the same thing with the contacts that I had. 
I was contacted them. I said, look, all you've got to do is sign it, send yeah. it off, put yeah. the pressure on, let them know that we're interested in this and uh, many people. But I, I was thinking maybe that it had something to do with this, uh, this dumbing down of information and, and the, the, the threat of legal action. And the I think it has to do with fear, Sean. I mean, I have, I, I, I have talked to a lot of people about this and, and it's something that's emerged in the last five years is there's a kind of fear of, 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 a, of a bad response from the, from the authorities or somebody like getting, it, getting at you and so on. It's always been the case that, that, uh, that, that there are an awful lot of people who will talk to each other and have conferences about these things. And so they all go to a conference and they go blah, 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 and the audience all clap and people get up and say, oh, isn't it the case? That, oh, yes, that's right. Isn't it awful? You know, and so forth. But if it comes to actual activity, there are very, very few people who, dare I say it, are brave enough to do these things. I mean, for example, Libby Halibi, she's brave enough to do this. She must know that somebody could rub her out, because this is America, yes? People have been rubbed out in America for this kind of stuff, you know? Sure. So when you start this, and when I started this, you have to consider that they might kill you. That's the worst that can happen. But there's a whole, there's a whole list of things that can happen before that, you exactly, know? They can get, yeah. get onto your income tax people, or they can get onto your... And in one case, this guy in Japan that I know, they actually tried to murder his kid, you know? So, like, these things happen. Uh, I have to say, not much has happened to me yet, anyway, tough wood. Maybe apart, apart from your emails being well, uh, disappearing. I, well, look at that sort of thing, you know? They, they, yeah. they get into your computer and take, take evidence or they yeah. do that stuff, you know? That's yeah. true. But nobody's actually tried to kill me. Sure. I've made it quite clear that if anyone does and they don't quite make it, then they're going to be in deep trouble. Because you know? <laughs> I'm not I'm not a sort of chicken, you know, I'm not no, a little no, sort of, of cuddly bunny, you know. I can I But you're can... so very high profile it would be uh, it, it seems that they tend to work in the way the stars yeah. work. Anyway, the way they get the way they go for me is they go for me by credit with credibility. So they yes, they I write they write reams of nonsense in, in Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia turned me recently from a scientist into an activist. Yeah. You know, and so um, I got somebody to turn it back very recently. But if you read my Wikipedia entry, it's just like ridiculous. So, so they do that kind of thing. Sure. They do that kind of thing. You know. Anyway, to get back to the the Euratom thing, we did actually. It does work. So this is the first thing you have to know: is it does work. They yeah. they scared to death. They actually, they're terrified of all of this, and they take a long time. They took two months to reply to me, and then there was a really considered response. You know, like we, and mostly all of the responses we've had. Have, have have essentially said, except for the Irish one, exactly. Yeah, uh, has have essentially, and and the ICRP one, they they actually sort of dealt with what we were saying. Because mm -hmm. what we're saying is this: look, the small amounts of radiation exposure that occurred after Chernobyl caused like a doubling of congenital malformations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what we're saying. So therefore. Anyone living near a nuclear power station or anyone exposed to these things in, in another situation will also have a, a doubling of congenital malformation. And of course this is true, and then a lot of those children die. So as I did recently, my recent study about fracking, which I did with Joe Mangano, yeah, we're going to come on to that. we'll talk about later, but, but children die, you see. Now the point is that you cannot justify an operation in which children die. And I'm not talking about a small amount of children, I'm talking about a, a, a significant number of dead children. And if you t take it over the whole period of time, there's an awful lot of them, millions. Or if you go back over the fallout and all the rest of it. But the point is we now have the evidence from Chernobyl that this is the case. Chernobyl was a ghastly experiment. It wasn't intended as an experiment, but given that it happened, it was an experiment. Another one is Fukushima, you see, and what they try to do is they p put the lid on all of this and say, oh, nothing happened, it's perfectly all right, and they bring in a load of bogus scientists to say, oh, well, we've done this study and that study, and nothing happens, and so on. But enough scientists in, in countries who are kind of, if you, say, if you like, non-aligned, so Turkey, Croatia, Egypt, Italy, um, quite a few countries where they studied the effects of Chernobyl and we're talking about some a long way away from Chernobyl Greece for example yeah, okay yeah. so you got a big increase in infant leukemia in Greece long way away from Chernobyl the doses were like less than a millisievert okay significant excess of infant leukemia which is a congenital malformation basically it's a it's a her heritable thing that occurs in the germ cell or in or in the developing fetus so so anyway so um, Mostly what they did was they wrote back, and in some cases they just refused to write back. So in the case of Sweden, we, kept, we, we, we actually had to go 
to the Swedish authorities. The, the video of you doorstepping and, and bang yeah. on the blooming door and say, "Oi, you know, we this is the law." And then we wrote, and so then following from that, so then he wrote back and he said, "Oh." We uh, uh, we trust the International Commission on the Radiological Protection. They didn't say anything about our evidence. They a, just yeah. said we leave it to the ICRP. But the law is nothing to do with the ICRP. The That's law right. is that that person and his organisation are the competent authority in the national member state, and they have to decide on the basis of all of the evidence what the situation is. But, I mean, they can certainly consider what the ICRP says, but the ICRP is not a legal body. It's just a, it's an independent organization. It's a charity, is it? It's a charity. It gets funding by the nuclear industry and all sorts of people. They don't tell you who funds it. But anyway, the point is, there it is. And I have to say that the, the, the caliber of the people in the ICRP is not high, to put it mildly. And basically, basically there are a lot of radiologists and nuclear physicists and all these people. Okay, so back to Sweden. So we doorstepped the guy and eventually he was forced to write to us and he said, well, we, we, we're not going to do anything, we rely on the ICRP. So I took that letter and I sent it together with a covering letter to the Swedish, um, what's it called, the, the Justice Chancellor. Now Sweden is interesting. In Denmark, long ago, the King of Denmark decided he didn't trust his, uh, his various ministries. So he set up a, an, an independent ministry called the Chancellor, the Justice Chancellor, the Justice Kanslert. And this outfit are supposed to, this is their job, is supposed to look over the legal situation with all the other ministries. And if there's something dodgy going on, they've got to do something about it. So anyway, we wrote to them and we also wrote to the Environment Ministry because the Environment Ministry are supposed to be the people who are administering this Euratom thing. So they're the administrators. They take advice from SSM. This is the guy, the Euratom guy. So he gives the advice. His advice is, oh, it's no problem. The ICRP is great. So I write to the, the Environment Ministry because they're the people who actually administer the law, like the Environment Agency in, in Ireland. And so that they wrote back and said, oh, we, we, we trust the SSM. You know, so that's my letter got back. We trust the SSM. So that's the situation in Sweden, and we're still waiting to hear back from the Justity Council. But if we don't hear from them, or even if we do hear from them, but it's a bit later, we're going to take the whole lot of this to, back to Europe now. So then we go to the European Commission, and we 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 uh, we say we want this now to go to the European Court of Justice because they have not administered the law. The law says these people must do that, yeah. and they haven't done it. Okay, they're, they're just quoting the they're ICRP. Just, they're just saying, oh no, we're not going to do it because the ICRP hasn't said anything about now, it. Interestingly, the Irish EPA, they, they stepped in and they, they said that there was, there did seem to be some problems with the I, what, what the ICRP are saying is the safe uh, doses of radiation. Yeah, internal. Um, now, they also said, you know, that, that they kind of are going with it, but they, they are aware that there is an argument uh, to be had about the levels and the damage they cause. Well, so they particularly, the Irish people particularly referred to Kerry. Mm. So, I mean, without going into great depth, the, 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 we managed to, I managed to persuade the, the minister, Michael Meacher, in 2000, to set up the committee examining radiation risk from internal emitters. Mm -hmm. And so this whole area has been fought over already, okay, long ago. And it didn't really, nothing much came out of it except the, the final report did say that there were questions about the, using internal rate, using the normal, uh, the, using the concept of absorbed dose, millisieverts, to define what happens with internal radiation. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a whole history of this. But it was quite clear that the woman who wrote back to you from, from the RPII was aware of this. It, that, so she was aware, well, I mean they're all aware of it, but she was prepared to concede that she was aware of it and that it was a debate, but that she said, she, I think she said something like, well, you know, we're still waiting to see if there's any more information or something like that. So it wasn't really, it actually wasn't a, an, a, a proper response because she didn't, she didn't deal with the Schmitz for but she, paper. But she, she obviously did say that she was put, putting that to someone else. To yeah, she with. did. And she, they're, they're doing that at She the said moment. they were still kind of like discussing or something like that. And yeah. of course, you know, Ireland is ideal for this because Ireland has nothing to gain from, 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 from this particular thing. Of course, you know, there might be behind the scenes pressure and so forth, but there are no yeah. nuclear power stations in Ireland. That's the point. And in fact, in the constitution, uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons are against the well, right, power right. So, I, so Ireland, as a, as a member state country, could do it, and also Austria could. But Austria, they haven't even sent it to the Austrian guy, you know. So goodness knows what's going on there.
Can, can we... uh, in France, well, we'll oh, just, right. just Sorry, quickly finish this. Yeah. So we've done Sweden, we've done Ireland. England, they got back and said they weren't doing anything, so we're going to send them straight to... And Kamari got back and they wrote some complete nonsense, which, which, which sort of dealt with it in a kind of way, but, but looked at, looked at um, evidence that Kamari was too old. Kamari in the UK, obviously. Kamari is the UK. It's a committee examining radiation risk from internal emitters. They were set up after the Sellafield... In leukemia, in child leukemia inquiry in 1993, and they they I mean, I have to say they're a bunch of dodgy characters, and always have been. Um, but but at the moment, they're not only a bunch of dodgy characters, but they're also a bunch of stupid do dodgy characters, you know. So their response was 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 pathetic, and it, 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 they just referred to evidence that had been that was a long time ago, 2002, and so on. And since this is new and important evidence, something sure. that happened in 2002 is irrelevant. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's two slaps. So that's those two. So then, we, so then the French, the French wrote back and said, you know, basically we're not going to do anything. We rely on the ICRP. Sure. And so did the uh, da the Danes. Danes the Danes. Right. Were, um, th but there was a lot of toing and froing with the Danes because they wrote back and they said we're not going to deal with it. And then so my Danish guy asked me, and he then he wrote back and said, well, blah blah. And they wrote back and said blah. So there was a bit of toing and froing, but ultimately, they said we rely on the ICRP. We're not going to do anything now. So that what they what they all have in in common, these people, is they have all referred it back to the. They've all said to us that they are referring it, that, that it's an ICRP matter not nothing to do with them which is not the law that's the point the law is it's nothing to do with the icrp that's right. the law is that, it, that it's the ball is in their court they have to deal with it they have to deal with the evidence the new and important evidence they can't just say they can't just not not mention the evidence they, sure. i mean what they could have said i mean they could have said none of them did that you made all this up they could have said, all of these different studies in the different countries were made up by anti-nuclear activists, and we don't trust any of them. They could have said, the populations were not properly defined, the epidemiology was no good, you know, like, the people who did it weren't proper epidemiologists. So there was no challenge to the Yeah, there was the none. There was no challenge, no, no challenge to them. And, and there hasn't ever been, there hasn't been any. So nobody's sure. written a paper saying that there were these problems right. with, with this paper. But the paper's you know. out there, it's not being contested. No, no, and it's been there for a year. And not only that, and we did reply, we sent this as well. My colleague Alexandra Fuchik, who I was with on the ch child health study, we had a big organisation called the Policy Information Network on Child Health and Environment, around about 2004, it lasted for three years, and we produced a report. And she and I were the co-rapporteurs on radiation. And she, she's a, a good guy, she's a scientist, she was an advisor to the WHO for a while, maybe still is, in Croatia. And she wrote a paper after the Schmitz-Feuerhack paper, like in, in about, I think, July 2016, in which she looked at genomic, in, genomic damage in populations exposed to Chernobyl. And so she, it's just a big review paper in a, in a post journal. So this is, another, this is another paper that shows that these small amounts of internal radiation are causing, you know, big changes in genetic uh, damage, big, big increases in genetic damage. So there's lots of evidence out there now which, which shows that the Basic Safety Standards Directive has to be redone. And so oh. that's the battleground. Okay, so um, just to finish off this Euratom section, and I wanted to bring up a, yet another paper that you were involved with that, that seems to hint at radiological damage uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. But uh, just to finish off, uh, for our UK viewers, uh, the Brexit um, situation. Now, when we're talking about Euratom, was that we, we, when we were looking at it, it seemed that the UK had its own independent Euratom format for dealing with these issues, uh, if, if I'm right. Um, and so do, do you think that the Brexit will affect the UK petition, or uh, as we're having to deal with a, a separate UK <coughs> sort of section of, of this uh, Euratom law, um, <clears throat> it will there be no effect. Uh, what would you uh, I think that the, the transposition of the BSS into English law, in fact there's been an upgrade update of that in 20, which is coming into force in 2018. Mm -hmm. But the up, up the update is not is not is not sufficiently different from the original one to make any difference as far as this is as far as this this just rejustification so is concerned Brexit or no Brexit yeah. the petition still goes it's ahead a, yeah. because because you're doing it specific it's to all the, the same UK the, the only thing that we can't do now is that if they say well we're not going to do anything we can't shock them up to the European
commission because they might, because you know it's nothing to do with that. But the UK High Courts. But the, yeah, of course we could do that. We could do that. But that takes money. I mean, I'd like to do that actually. I'd like to do a judicial review. Of what, but 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 the last time I tried a judicial review, the the table judge. That's the guy who says we're going to allow this or we're not going to allow this. He threw it out for no good reason at all, you know. But, sure. but, but because you know the law is what is is bought and sold, and in, in, you know as we know from the test first case, you know you can get dodgy judges. Yeah. And so he threw it out. Not only that, then they fined us two thousand seven hundred and fifty. I had to give them two thousand seven hundred fifty pounds for having had the temerity to suggest that they might be wrong in the interpretation of the law. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Boof. Yeah, no, it's uh, certainly, there's, there's been a lot of issues with uh, the UK judicial system um, and, and, you know, what sort of biases have, have been brought into various court cases, uh, not just to do with nuclear. But, uh, right, OK, well, let, let's move on now, because you was in, in, within the Euratom, we're saying, uh, petition, we're saying, look, the, look here is the evidence, um, the amount of dose that's been worked out has been worked out over 75 years and not a shorter time frame where the damage is happening. Um, that, that seems to be sort of the, ba the basis of, of some of the, the petition that we're doing. So when we're looking at the fracking and uranium paper that yourself and Joe Mangano have done, um, then what, what sort of, uh, you know, it's had about 3,300 odd uh, downloads in, in the yes, last no, month. Yes, no, it's going well. Well, so, that hasn't been covered in any newspaper. Any newspaper has not covered it. It's not been challenged. No. Okay. And and so we have these these two points. And uh, but what I wanted to do is zero in um, because this can be found online, and we'll we'll uh, link to it. Uh, but the issue about the ray, uh, the uh, isotopes causing damage uh, from the fracking. Um, where, where are these isotopes coming from? Are they coming from the rocks that are being fractured? Are they coming from, because uh, there's obviously people saying they're, they're in the fluids that, that, that uh, are causing the fracking. Uh, what, what's your anticipation on, on where these, well, well, it's radium, is it? Yeah, well, un underground, there's a lot of natural background radiation. And this, this is mainly in uranium-238. Now, uranium-238, uh, is ubiquitous, and when it decays, it decays through uranium-234 to radium-226. So anywhere where you're going to find uranium, you're going to find radium as well. And it's in all of the rocks underground. So if they go down and they, and they, and they smash the rocks into little pieces, the surface area of the rock becomes much greater, of course. You know? And so the water that's down there, and, and also including the water they pump down, which is a lot of water that they pump down with various chemicals to free up the spaces and so forth, with sand mainly to sort of as a, what they call propant. Um, so then the, 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 the newly formed surfaces with all its radium and uranium and all that dissolve in the water, mainly radium, because radium is more soluble than uranium. Uranium is quite insoluble. But so when they pump this stuff down then, it, 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 it fills up with radium. And when it comes to the surface, it has lots of radium. This has been known since the 80s, and in connection with oil exploration, not, not fracking, but just standard oil drilling in Louisiana and Texas and so on. The produced water that comes up, that pushes the oil up, that's very radioactive. It's huge amounts of radium in it, and then they leave all this radio the water to evaporate in the sun, and then radium just is everywhere. And uh, I've done a lot of court cases in the in Louisiana and um, and in Texas and and down 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 south where they do all this uh, on on this issue. So there's no question. So, about I mean, the game. in the respect that the, uh, the 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 actual radium and uh, the liquid that it's in uh, basically is, is leaching into aquifers and into the wells. I th my own feeling is that is that. And you have, this is speculation, but certainly it comes up with the with the water, mm. and then that water is not is supposed to be treated. It's supposed to be taken away because they know it's radioactive. Mm. But there are a number of, of times where they just don't bother. They just tip it, you know, because it's cheaper for them. And then it gets into the groundwater, but also it gets into the groundwater directly because the groundwater is in the ground. So if you have, if, so it's, you know, if you drill a well anywhere. You'll get water out. That, I mean, that's that, that's so, well so known, there's two you know. pathways. Basically. So, so the people who have um, private water wells, their wells will be contaminated with radium because of this through this effect. You see, either of the two pathways. Yes. Basically. Well, I mean, that's what I followed up in the paper. Uh, you know, I, uh, I I looked at the um, the density of private water wells in the, in the counties of Pennsylvania, 
And what we found was a clear correlation between the increase in infant mortality from congenital, well, early infant mortality, 0 to 28 days. Mm. We saw a, a clear increase in that uh, directly proportional to the density of, water, of private water wells in the counties. Mm -hmm. So that's what made me feel it was it, that was the effect. Um, of course, we can't rule out that it was an effect due to uh, some chemical that they that they produced, you know, that went into the groundwater. But it's not some chemi it's not actually a vapor chemical because that then it wouldn't have been related to the density of water wells. It would have been just people would have inhaled it and so on. So we would have had a, an effect that wasn't related to the density. It would have been larger field than the water wells. Well, it would have just like I mean we had twenty counties. And so you could list those counties on a graph uh, according to the number, the, the water well density, and you know the more water, the bigger the water well density, the more dead babies, basically. Right. So, um, what I'd like to do now, because we're trying to uh, sort of uh, get to the end, but we we talked a bit about the BNTV uh, case. Uh, uh, yeah, you want to know where that went to? British nuclear okay, test right. veterans. So. Okay, well, we lost the case in December. The judge threw out our experts and said they were all activists. Um, and basically, he didn't. the judge didn't respond to the evidence. So there was a lot of evidence brought in by, by the eminent experts that I called. Uh, of course, I could no longer act as an expert because he ruled me out as an activist. So then I brought in four other professors one from Japan, one from Germany, and two from, one from England, one from Ireland. These eminent people with like hundreds of papers to their name, scientific papers. Uh, and they were magnificent. They were absolutely magnificent. They were attacked to death by, by the Ministry of Defence lawyer, Hep, Adam Hep, Hepstall. Um, but they just stood their ground. And, and uh, I, I was, I brought tears to my eyes watching, watching this old lady, uh, Inga Schmitz Feuerhaker, you know, taking on taking on this, this, this lawyer who was really quite rude, uh, you know, and offhand and, and, and cruel. Anyway, she dealt with him. Um, and in fact, they all did. They all did. But the judge then said, oh, well, they're activists, and, you know, I'm not going to listen to anything that they say, so he didn't address it. But what the interesting thing that happened was that the... Um, that the lawyer happens to all, that the Ministry of Defence... Defense, mainly consisted of trying to exclude all our evidence. So when I, so, so he wrote a, um, a report about halfway through the, well, towards the end of the trial, uh, in which he said that he didn't need to deal with, because we, we'd, we'd, we'd said, look, that he hasn't dealt with any of our evidence. The High Court judge before had said that the way this court had, the case had to go was that we provide our evidence, they deal with the evidence, we respond to their evidence, then we go into trial, you see. But none of this happened because we provided our evidence and they didn't respond to our evidence. They just said a whole lot. They just came in with a complete different set of, of their own ideas using standard ICRP methodology. This was the dose, too low to cause the cancers, couldn't have caused the congenital malformation in the children. So that, that's what they said. I, I, I read the documents and Geraldine Thomas at one point actually said, even though she had been slated by other scientists, and and she had to they had to pull the BBC documentary. But but where she was saying that 100 millisieverts per year is uh, is it, it, or under it would cause no health effects whatsoever, ignoring all the linear well uh, all the, models. Well, their, their position happened. their position that they that they presented uh, was was the standard ICRP position. But here's the point: the point is that that Heppenstall and and the Treasury solicitor stated quite clearly that the that they didn't have to respond in writing to what it was our experts were saying because their experts had been given this information and they would respond in the witness box okay that's written down black and white yeah but when it came to the cross examination which i did um they they t they said and i asked them specifically they said they hadn't been asked to deal with this evidence and that heppensall had not provided them with this uh, with, with, a, with a, a remit to respond to the evidence. Now the point is that the High Court had said that this is how the case should be done, but it wasn't done like that. It was fitted up. So it was fitted up in such a way, and we don't know to the extent to which the judge was, collude, was colluding with this, and I haven't said that he, he was, but he might have been. But certainly the strategy of the MOD solicitor was to exclude all of this evidence, but but he, 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 he mucked up because he said that he had told the his uh, his um, 
uh, experts to deal with it and in fact they said he hadn't did okay. you actually say that the experts were, were given uh, guidelines and what they could yes, talk yes, about yes, and what yeah, they couldn't? They so all, well, no, it wasn't that. They were told, they, they, were, he, they said that they were not told, they were not asked to deal with any of the evidence that we put in. Yeah, That's what they by said. By someone? Well, yeah, no, by the Treasury solicitor. He, he's the one right. who, who commissions them. Okay. You know, he gets and them that, along. that goes against the, uh, the recommendations of the judge? That, uh, yeah, that goes against the recommendations of the judge that set up this, because, you know, this came from an appeal. So the original judge, then there was an appeal, now there's a new trial. This is the new trial, okay? Well, the appeal judge said that the, Sir William Charles, he said this is how it's got to be done. But it wasn't done like that, you see. It wasn't done like that. And not only was it not done like that, but it was not done like, done like that in a sort of sneaky way. Yes? Okay. So the point is that I then, what I did was I, I shopped up Heppenstall to the Bar Standards Council. Okay. I right. think we're on slap suit number three at the moment, Chris, so uh, no, but anyway, but do carry I, on. I, I mean, you, they can slap at me as much <laughs> as they like, you know. Uh, uh, well, it's ahead. usually the, judge, uh, the journalists that get hit, but we, we, we we're, ju we're bloggers and we don't really care. So I don't care, no. I mean, this is the truth. Mm. So uh, so we've sent Heppenstall off to the bar, st bar Standards Board and they're taking it up too. So they wrote back and said, oh yes, yes, this is a very serious accusation blah 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 but they said we're going to wait now in the letter I got or the phone call I got from this woman from the bar standards board she said, they, she said we're going to wait now until we see what the judge says in the appeal because we've appealed on the basis of this you see so we've sent it back to the appeal court you see so the okay. guy the, so there's the appeal court guy he says this is how it should be done so I then said appeal 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 you, they didn't do it like this it's gone back to him you see mm. All right, now, so he's in a difficult place, you know, because, because he's got to now decide whether it was done properly or not. And it quite obviously wasn't done properly, okay? Mm -hmm. So, but if he, so I tell you what, I tell you what, if he decides, if he decides that he's going to throw it out, then he's going to go to the Bar Standards Council, all right? Because he will have made a statement, this is how it should be done. It wasn't done like that, and he hasn't done anything about it. Okay. okay. Right, so, 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 that's so, so you've pinned him down there. So that's right. the position there. Now, I'd just like to go back to the, the point where they say they are activists, quote unquote. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> according, according to this judge, it would appear that if you're a black person, if you're, if you're a person of colour, that you wouldn't be able to talk on matters of discrimination. Uh, would that be a, a natural progression of this new judicial thing where that if you're if you're an activist you can't talk about any con well, well, any ecological access you can't talk about ecology uh, and if you're a black person I think you so. would be able to talk about I think about so I think it's a, it, but but actually it's not the judge it's a, it's a particularly monstrous interpretation of uh, precedent there there is law about this there, there was there are various cases in which, and the the main one is based on is a case called the Icarian Reefer Sure. Where, where, where some boat, some ship had some disaster and they brought in an expert witness who then turned out to then have a position because he was connected in some way to the company who, and this is fair enough really, yeah, so he was connected to the company who had a, who, who, the outcome of which, of the trial, which, which would have affected, so if was, he was biased, right, mm -hmm. effectively that was it. Sure. So, the, inter the, the, so the, the, the Sir William Charles judge, the appeal court judge, he, he was asked to rule on, on this point of the Icarian Reef about whether I had a position, whether I had a kind of pre-existing position and I was not basically a, an, a, a, an independent, neutral expert, okay? But of course all scientists have a, have a, a position, you know? They, their position is, is developed as a result of the research that they've done and, you know, the way in which they've approached they it. Told and, to say and in case and of ma Mainly it's about interpretation. Oh, it's about interpretation. Yeah. But in the case of the nuclear industry um, expert witnesses, well, no, what shall I call them, the MOD expert uh, witnesses, mm. I mean, certainly one of them, that, that appalling Thomas woman, she right, was sir. just quite clearly biased. I mean, mm. she, you know, it was just absurdly biased. I mean, nothing like the sort of thing I am, you know. She, she was just talking nonsense. She was, like, talking stuff just in order to prove her position. Do you think she was better paid than you, though? As well. well, I wasn't paid at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so she was better paid. So she can't have been paid. On she can't have been paid less than I was paid. Okay, so all right, so so the bottom line is with that is that the, the, this issue about you know and, and my experts, incident talking about yeah. paid, yeah, um, they weren't paid either. I, I gave them two hundred quid because I, you know because basically that that's like the extra expenses that you do, get. Do you have any figures on how much the MOD costs are? I think that Di, Di Williams said it was over two million. 
two million for that, yeah. just, just that portion of the court case. Oh no, that point, well no, it must be, it must be. I mean, those people hep like Heppenstall, they go out for like two thousand pounds a day, and this is like three weeks. Okay. Okay. Right. So and it's that, very lucrative for the. Oh the, God's teeth, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Did, you ever thought about swapping sides and and. Um, um, <laughs> You know, you could buy a moe and... Uh, Listen, you've stuff. got to live with yourself, you know. You're, only, you're on this planet for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how these people can live with themselves is entirely beyond me. Sure. How, how that woman, that woman... Uh, uh, maybe she's just stupid and she believes that stuff, but... But anyway... I well, I, I was, I was uh, doing some communication with her uh, in the early days and, uh, of Fukushima. And um, she was getting all her um, uh, information, all the anything to do with dose, anything complicated. Um, and we were talking about cesium and its effects in Chernobyl, and she was saying there was no effect. And, uh, and in fact, she was uh, giving me a lot of uh, paperwork that was coming direct from uh, a guy called uh, um, Richard Wakeford, uh, who obviously you know. So um, uh, I've, I've, I've seen nothing to say that, uh, that she's developed this knowledge herself. I think she's getting it from a, a third party. Well, it's certainly not her area. I mean, her, her area, she's a biochemist. I mean, although you would think you wouldn't, wouldn't understand that by listening to what she says about chemistry. But that's her particular area, biochemistry. Um, anyway, let's try and avoid slap suit number five. Uh, so, well, uh, I think we could probably just like try and finish up here now. Um, I, I, I know that you can't talk about uh, the USS Ronald Reagan particularly. Well, except to say um, that the case is going forward, and the it's, it's with the, forward. The, the, the this is the case where um, the people who went uh, to help the, the population of, of Fukushima in uh, the U.S. Navy fleet. Uh, headed up by the USS Ronald Reagan, and then they they copped quite a lot of radioactivity from which blew out to sea and blew over there. Sure. Uh, uh, and so there was a, so they a lot of those people are sick with cancer and various other illnesses, and so they they brought a case against TEPCO and uh, and G General Electric, well TEPCO mainly, and the TEPCO lawyers argued that it should be heard in Japan, and of course the lawyers in California, my lawyers, because I'm on that case. Um, they said it should be heard in California because it was like an American, American ship, uh, and then so this went up. This went up to the Ninth Circuit to the Appeal Court to decide whether it should be heard in one place or another. Sure. And uh, the U.S. State Department has said that they 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 don't have anything to say about it. They they're not going to argue that it should be heard in Japan. And in fact, they were they sort of came out in favour of it being heard in America. That was the last. So, but that's still at the appeal court, and so we, that's I'm, not going to go ahead until the appeal court makes a decision following their uh, amicus brief. It's an amicus curiae. This is like a friend of the court brief from the U.S. State Department. I realise you can't talk about processes while the the case is ongoing. So, well, I can't talk um, about what what we're going to say. What you're going to say. So, um, is there anybody else involved with that uh, in, um, in terms of experts? As far or? as I know, that, uh, that, uh, Helen Caldicott is 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 has been asked to. To, to be involved as an expert. Um, I'm doing a case with her at the moment on uh, with the same law firm in, in Illinois, which is sort of going ahead, but I've got to go there next week. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's that concerning? Oh, that's a straightforward case. There's some guys that, that they, is it, well, I better not say anything about okay, it. Okay, right, it's, no, you know, that's fine, yeah. that's fine. Uh, well, look, Chris. Uh, I think we can we can round off here. I think I think we're going to have a little part two. There's just a couple of little questions I wanted to ask about you personally, your history, and things like this. Um, but um, but thank you very much for all the information that you've uh, given us. Uh, thanks for all your work in terms of all the court cases that you're involved with and that you're trying to be involved with in the future. Um, and um, I just hope that you're going to get more support from from the uh, community yes. at yeah. large. I yeah. realise they have their pressures. We talked about slap suits with journalists. We talked about, well, we, we, we talked a little bit about the surveillance, in, especially in the UK, which is, Edward Snowden has said is the worst in the world. Um, and uh, I'm obviously a victim of some of that stuff myself. Well, I'm so, kind of on my own, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have been sort of, in some strange way, excluded from the mainstream anti-nuclear movement and the mainstream green movement. I mean, probably following Monbiot, yeah. but uh, I'm going to. We're going to win this, and the way that we're going to win this is through science. We're going to do it through scientific journals, mm -hmm. publishing uh, uh, stuff like this, um, this Mangano paper about fracking, mm -hmm. 
that's going to go into the peer review literature. Increasingly, I'm being approached by journals uh, to write papers for them. You know, I, I mean, they, I write, they write to me all the time. Sure. And also they write to me to be um, a reviewer. So I'm like the big deal scientist in this area, but interestingly, I'm totally excluded from the normal discourse of my. It, it is know. very bizarre because you you are connected to quite a few journals now. Yes, you have papers that are constantly it's, it's coming out. It's extraordinary, extraordinary. So, for instance, and, you know, they have a meeting in London yeah. recently. We were talking about that, or my, I was talking about that, where there are all these people talking about nuclear, and not a single person is talking about the health effects, and not a single. Well, maybe one person is, fairly, but but. All of the papers, like 30 papers that I've got in the period of literature showing that there are such health effects. Hinkley Point, Bradwell, um, Charles Phillips, nuclear power stations, the, that one in America, um, Diablo Canyon, is it, that one? I've, I've studied loads and loads of these sites and d done standard epidemiological studies that show that there is an effect, yet nobody uses them. Nobody uses them. I mean, well, and this is the anti-nuclear people they don't use them. They even get into the Daily Mail and they get into newspapers. But the, but they, but the, the, the anti-nuclear groups and the green groups and all that just refuse to deal with them at all. Yeah. They don't use them. Well, as I, I think I think we were talking about the fact that that if they were to, and it's certainly you've been seeing what's been happening with me on my Facebook over the last week, where where I get as soon as I talk about some sort of health effect uh, of of an isotope in this case plutonium, uh, that I have uh, somebody from uh, Australia, somebody from America, somebody from the UK, all connected to the nuclear industry and one of them connected to Wade Allison, the very big pro nuke guy, uh, trying to actually pull apart my argument that there's a problem with this plutonium. Now, they lost that argument on the Facebook. Uh, you know, they, they did, they, their basic science was wrong. They didn't want to discuss the basic science. They just wanted to sort of beat around the bush and try and say that the article itself was bad. It's another ad hominem attack on the journalist, basically. I can't understand it. I mean, I, ha yeah. I really can't understand it. But, but I think a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of the activists, a lot of the people at the top of the Green Party, they they'll get the Roger Helbigs, the, all these different people that that will contact them and put huge pressure on them. You know, and we're not talking about just one person. Uh, I think we're we're talking about multiple people. Get you know, sending emails, letters, and whatnot. I don't. Know. I, well, I, I, it's, 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 it's a, a lot, great pressure on that. I, I sort of, I think I've been categorised yeah. as some kind of monster. I think that's yeah. what it is, you know, so, some frightening person. I think somebody did say that to me. You know, said that they're just frightened of you being there. They're frightened that you'll do something. Well, maybe it's the beret, Chris. <sighs> well, it's got to be more than that. <laughs> I mean, Linus Pauling wore a beret. Yeah. Lots of people, and, and uh, uh, Messiaen. You know, there are lots of people wear berets. No, this yeah. is true. This is true. Well, look, um, Chris, thanks a lot for the uh, for the interview. We're going to pass this on to um, uh, okay. Libby Halevi. Um, yeah. She's probably going to cut and edit and mess around with it and right, squeeze it sure. into her show. Okay. And um, yeah, any final word for for Libby? You know, great six years of uh, of constant high, you know, high pressure activism. Well, I'd, I'll give her a big hug and a kiss. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Seven minutes. Well, that's